Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Thank you guys for joining us today live. And for those of you watching the replay, we're glad that you can tune in. This is the Capture One Hangout, and it is sponsored by Aftershoot. We'll give you a quick look at this product later on today. Aftershoot is an AI culling tool that works seamlessly with Capture One, makes it really easy to find your best pictures and then hand them off. Our agenda today, we're going to talk about the photo editing workflow in Capture One. So some of you are brand new to Capture One. Some of you have been using it for a while. Everyone's going to get some tips from this. We'll also address some of the things that are new in the latest Capture One update. And we're going to go straight to the source with David Grover from the Capture One team. We'll share some favorite Capture One tips and tricks for color editing and color grading. And again, feel free if you've got tips or things you want to share or resources, you could put those in the chat pod to share with everyone else. Let us know what's on your mind. Welcome, Jeff from Canada. Glad you can join us. And uh, it is cold and snowy in parts of the world still, isn't it? And uh, we'll also at the end talk about how you can integrate Aftershoot to speed up some AI powered culling and sorting to add tags and keywords as well as stars and color labels to find your best photos. Okay, keep them moving forward. My name's Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of photofocus.com. We've been publishing now for 23 years with news, advice, tips, tutorials, and inspiration all about photography on a daily basis. And uh, we're glad that you guys can join us. I'm the publisher behind the website. So I get to put together the great site. We've got a wonderful team of more than 25 different writers who share their techniques from their photography workflow. Uh, well, also, when I get the time, I like to record video courses to help other photographers. So I'm glad you guys could consider checking some of those out. I've been releasing them a lot through the years. I really enjoy both landscape and travel photography and do a lot with both HDR and panoramic imagery. So feel free to check some of those out when you get around to it. If you do want to connect, you're welcome to reach out onto LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with any of you. But I'd like to put the attention to our guest our expert today, which is David Grover. David, welcome. How are you? Just got to unmute myself. Nearly fell into that Zoom trap then. Um, <laughs> I'm well, thanks. Thanks, uh, Rich, for inviting me on today as well. Excellent. We're glad to have you. And, and David, you are well known as an expert of Capture One. Give folks a little bit about your background. How long have you worked on the product? And what are some of the things you do on a regular basis? So I'm coming up for my, as you can see on the slide, coming up for my 10 year work anniversary so when i started at capture one it wasn't really capture one then it was phase one uh, and capture one was really designed as an application uh, as a vehicle to work with phase one cameras because there wasn't anything existing that would work with a phase one camera when phase one was launched probably 28 years ago now i think something like that um so Capture One was born, but then, as I said, 10 years ago, when I started, Capture One was still under the umbrella of uh, Phase One. Uh, there was four of us working full-time for Capture One at that point. And then fast forward to present day Capture One, even though we're still owned by the same people that own Phase One, we are a completely separate company now. Um, and that number of four people, their full-time is, uh, I've lost count, but it must be in the 80 to 100 now, I would say. Just a few more co-workers. <laughs> yeah, a few more co-workers than myself, uh, my boss at the time, Linda, and I think a student worker and one other person. So now, you know, in my team alone, there's six to eight of us, I think, which just focuses on community and education and, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, a big change from 10 years back, that's for sure. Well, we're really glad to have you. And folks, one of the main benefits here is the opportunity to actually ask questions. So please feel free to put those into the Q&A pod yeah, and we'll work those into today's presentation. We're glad to have you. And if you wanna check out some of the tutorials that the Capture One team puts together, you can head on over to their YouTube channel. And David, you're the host of the live streams that you do there as well. Pretty much, so we do a live stream it varies, but uh, probably around four times a month, something like that, or three to four times. And you'll always find uh, the upcoming live streams pretty much uh, at the top of that page. So it's easy to, to locate. Um, and yeah, there's lots of content on there, short tutorials, longer tutorials, recordings, so everything. Excellent. Well, why don't we go ahead and we're gonna get things underway. 
So okay. David, I invite you if you would like to share your screen and kick us off with our first technique. What I'm seeing from folks is that uh, we've got different levels of organization uh, approved and we've got people with big photo libraries spread out okay. on lots of drives. And uh, we got a lot of people coming from Lightroom and Lightroom Classic who are interested okay. in learning more as well as some long-term Capture One users. So it's great to see a little bit of everything here today. Cool. Well, I think the first thing to say to the Lightroom folks is that you don't really have to learn a whole bunch of different techniques or, or different things. You've already got the understanding of what a raw converter does, um, hopefully. You've got some understanding of organizing your photos. I was I was looking uh, at, at the poll, of course, uh, how important um, that is. Um, and I probably fit into the organized to slash somewhat organized, even though I should be in the, the very organized. Um, but as I said, you don't really have to learn anything um, different in that respect. So Lightroom uses a library, Capture One does exactly uh, the same thing. So if you already have an existing Lightroom library, we can actually import that. So if I just show you on screen, so up here, import Lightroom catalog. It's not something I would suggest you do on the first time you open Capture One, because if you have a large library, and again, looking at the, the poll results, I can see you've got some large collections. Doesn't make sense to import hundreds of thousands of pictures on the first day of use of Capture One. You want to get comfortable with it. and. Uh, and people forget that they didn't import those hundreds of thousands of pictures into the Lightroom in one go. Either. In one so go, like, exactly. It takes so long. Yeah. It's like, yes, it took you about 10 years to do all that. To, to do that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't make that the first thing. But once you've you know been through your trial in Capture One and uh, you are feeling a bit more comfortable, then you can feel about those, those steps. But really, um, another important difference, I think, to get your head around in terms of image organization is that Lightroom is very much modal. So you have your library mode or module, whatever you want to call it, develop module and so on. That doesn't exist in Capture One. It's more of a flat interface. So you can access your library at any time. Uh, in these little tool tabs, which appear in the top left, the first one is devoted to library management. So you can see just down on my left-hand side, I've got my folder structure of what I've imported into my catalog. Again, very similar to Lightroom. And I've got some virtual collections up here. Again, very similar to Lightroom as well. So I can organize pretty extensively. And I would say a difference to uh, Lightroom is that I can very easily work in multiple catalogs as well. So if I wanted to close down and open another catalog, I can simply say file open and open up another one of my catalogs, even leaving this one open in the background as well. So there's a little bit more flexibility like that as well. Um, and hopefully not to confuse you with giving you this piece of information, but if you don't like catalogs and you just want to browse your file system, you can actually do that as well in Capture One. Uh, we have an alternative file management workflow called Sessions, which were designed really as uh, a way to manage a single project. So if you're going into the studio for the day and shooting tethered, or if you're going on location for a few days and doing a, a single project, which you want to manage without importing it into your catalog, you can do that as well. And that was really a workflow designed specifically uh, for that purpose. Um, but if you want to, you can also use the session just as a file browser and you can browse your file structure existing files and folders as you wish. So there's lots of flexibility there as well. Nice. Nice, yeah. Um, so other thing for the Lightroom people, we we're, we're kind of see the interface as, as we move through it and do a little bit of editing uh, and so on. But really the, the main difference is, let's just throw up a picture on screen. We'll just come out of Panorama for a second. Let's just pop this picture up. Um, pretty much like all the other raw converters out there, you know, we have some way of browsing the current collection that we're looking at. Uh, by default, Capture One sits the browser or thumbnails on the right hand side. Uh, we have the viewer in the center, which allows us to, you know, zoom in and pan around our, our picture. And I guess slightly different to Lightroom is that along the top in the center, 
these guys here, these are different cursor tools that change the behavior of the cursor. And quite a good little tip I can give you if you're interested in picking up Capture One is don't forget these enhanced uh, tool tips. Not that Capture One does this vastly differently than anyone else, but if you're not sure of what a particular tool does, then you can simply hover your cursor over the top. You get a short description and then a link to click through and read more about it. That's just a really quick and easy way to, to learn about the interface. Nice. Something you can also do, which uh, I would suggest everyone tries, again, maybe not in the first five days of your experience, but everything in Capture One is customizable. So if you would prefer to have let's just say Lightroom style, if you would prefer to have the uh, tools on the right hand side, mm -hmm. then we can do so. Uh, you can rearrange the order that the tools go in. You can have floating tools. You can right click on any tool tab and add whatever tool you want. Um, and of course we can save our workspace as well. So we can always instantly get back to whatever workspace we want. And that's a very popular feature of Capture One to existing users. Uh, there is really no such thing as the perfect default workspace. I'm sure if we look at Rich's setup, it looks completely different to my setup. If we looked at the people watching, of those who are using Capture One, I'd be surprised if everyone has it all set up in the same way. So it's nice that you can bend the application to, to work in your, in your way. Um, but that's something you can try a little bit later on. But you know, even if you've say downloaded Capture One by default, the workspace looks like uh, this. So not vastly different to mine. Um, just check that default. Yeah, so not vastly different to mine. But if you're never going to shoot tethered, having an entire tool tab that is devoted to tethered shooting doesn't make sense. So then we can just get rid of that entire tab with a right click and it's gone. So but for those of you who haven't tried tethered shooting, it is a lot of fun if you're in a studio environment Definitely. and you want to let the client see what you're doing, or if you're shooting tabletop type shoots or product shoots, because exactly. you can actually control the camera and really immediately start to review your files, make sure they're looking their best. Yeah. Without peering on a tiny LCD screen <laughs> or trying to show your client, if you're working with someone, a little tiny screen, this is how it's going to look, but not quite because I need to edit it first and so on. At least as, as you said, Rich, when you're shooting tethered, you get a much closer impression of how it's going to look on the end result. So. Excellent. Well, let's tackle editing uh, maybe a landscape photo to start. And, yeah, uh, sure, and sure. then I'll show off your panoramic feature. I've got an unusual panorama, but let's do an image or two first, David. I, I see you cool. got a lot of great images here. And I think one thing that people don't always understand going in is that uh you know you do a real natural decode on the raw so the colors are yep. not pushed super hard to begin with because you want to bring that out as part of the develop process yeah ex exactly um i mean as this is on screen let's just have a little look at this because it's got quite a nice interesting issue with uh with the sky but every camera so if we bring out this tool called base characteristics and this is a tool which you really don't have to interact with at all. I'm just bringing it out so we can talk about it for 30 seconds. Uh, but every camera in Capture One is treated as an individual, if you like. So we don't rely on the OS for color profiling or camera support or anything like that. We do everything in-house. So each camera has its own bespoke color profile. And that's not just shooting a target and letting a computer decide what the profile should be. That's the first step. And then we actually look at it and we put the camera through about 700 different shots uh, to fine tune the color profile by eye, if you like, with the goal being, as you said, Rich, to have a nice, natural, pleasing start point, which shouldn't be full of errors in terms of color reproduction, but it allows you to then add your creative um, input. And the curve section there is quite powerful as well, because before you've done any sort of adjustments, yeah. you know, I like here, you're actually tapping into some of the Fujifilm color profiles that they yeah. kind of apply to their JPEGs in camera processing. Yeah, exactly. So if you're a Fujifilm fan, 
so for most of the supported Fujifilm cameras, so that's anything from like an X-T2 onwards, I think, or maybe X-T3, don't quote me on that. Uh, but we do have the Fujifilm sims built into Capture One. And if I shot on the camera in Classic Chrome, as an example, Capture One would then show it to me as Classic Chrome, but I could always override it to something else. Mm -hmm. But these will be extremely close uh, to the film simulations because we work in partnership with Fujifilm to, to deliver that. So these should be nice and accurate. Uh, and if you're, if you're using not... if you're using other cameras, then you guys have some of those more generic film extra high contrast standard. Yeah, so we have extra shadow, and you can see in the background it just opens up. The shadow is a bit high contrast, is a bit punchier. Uh, standard, if you like, is just what we deliver as standard. And down the bottom here is linear response, which is a really, really, really flat um, output, which is good if you like to exercise full control, uh, but you will have to do a little more work on the file to get it into something export ready, if, you're, yeah. if you like. And what's um, cool is as you mouse over those, you could see how the histogram is changing, kind yeah. of looking at how it's pushing or pulling the, the image data. It really kind of helps you know what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So linear response is good for perhaps a really difficult image with tons of high dynamic range in it um, or, or, you know, loads of shadows, loads of highlights, and you just really need to kind of pull it around and try and get the most out of it. But generally it's, you know, you're best off with good old film standard, which is auto. Auto doesn't mean do something automatic to the picture. It means use the curve that was used to create the profile of the camera at Capture One. And generally that's film standard. Um, and there's some other standards called Pro Standard as well, which is available on some cameras, which mm -hmm. is just a further refinement of some of these. Um, they're not on the Fujifilm cameras because some of the elements of Pro Standard are already built into the Fuji film sims. So that would be reinventing the wheel. So this was probably shot with um, the standard Provia. So if I leave it on auto, that will be Provia. Oh, and to finish that story, as well as that, each camera has a bespoke noise reduction profile as well. It's always set to 50, 50, 50, but under the hood, depending on the camera and its sensor performance, it might need a bit extra or it might not need so much. And each camera has a default level of sharpening as well. So with these two things combined and the base characteristics, you should be at a very nice start point. Now I noticed David uh, up at the top, we have some different cursors. Would you mind showing off the ability of using a loop when doing something like noise? Yeah, reduction? sure. So we got, I think a lot of people story. struggle with noise reduction and they don't understand what the loop tools for. Yeah. So let's make this guy a bit bigger actually. Sure. Uh, loop size. Let's go large. And Cause I should... noticed that a lot of people overly do noise reduction or over sharpen and they don't really understand. And this is beautiful yeah. here because you're really seeing at 100%. And if you don't look at 100%, you're not actually sharpening or noise reduction. You're, no, you're like playing with the preview. <laughs> yeah, sharpening on the, uh, uh, on the preview, if you like, you really can't tell what's going on. I mean, fortunately, you know, we can also zoom at 100% and move around the picture with pretty speedy performance. I mean, I'm lucky just for full transparency. This is a uh, MacBook Pro M1 Max. Yep. Uh, so it's nice and punchy. Um, but to be honest, on my previous Mac, which was an Intel Mac, uh, the performance is still pretty slick, but the M1 does tend to blow it out the water in terms of export times and doing more complex editing. So that's that's a big leap. But, but that was yeah, something the, that you guys, you, you guys with the latest update have been adding some improvements for M1 Mac, I believe. Yeah, so we have we have an update coming out and probably actually not, depending on how the final beta test check goes, really in, in the next few days, I would say, but that's going to have some additional M1 uh, performance tricks to it. Uh, so luminosity masking, which we can always look at, that gets... I think it's something like a 300% increase. Feathering gets something ridiculous like an 1,000% increase. So it's just going through and cleaning up you know, and optimizing bits of code uh, 
for, for that processor platform as well, but it really makes a, a big, big difference. So um, yeah, if I was to edit this one, you can see it's pretty nice out of camera. So not, not much to do. Uh, like for the Lightroom users out there, maybe slightly differently, we split up high dynamic range away from the exposure tool. So exposure tool you would well know, so I can brighten or darken everything um, by the same amount. A brightness tool, which correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, I don't think there's really an, an equivalent in Lightroom. Nope. Uh, but what the brightness tool does, so obviously if I push exposure, everything gets brighter. Double click to reset. Uh, if we push brightness, what it's doing, if we're nerding out on the histogram, uh, you can see if I push up exposure, everything starts to creep to the right quite quickly. If we push open brightness, it actually pegs the brighter tones to some extent where they are. So we mm -hmm. can lift up the mid tones quite nicely without ruining our highlights. So on a shot like this, which is maybe a little bit muddy kind of down here, we can open up the brightness without messing up what's going on. With and that's a nice alternative instead of, pushing the exposure over and then trying to slam back the highlights yes. and the white point to so compensate. This is just I'd do that. Yeah. That, gives you a little more flexibility. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Whereas one action with the slider, that's much faster as well. And whenever you're fighting adjustments against each other, there's normally a compromise thrown in there somewhere. So having this adjustment uh, is really nice, but it, it's misunderstood generally because brightness, it's not, especially descriptive name what does that actually mean i mean mid-tone bump <laughs> is, is not a particularly elegant name or something like that but but that's kind of what it's doing but in this case i still might pull them down a bit um looking into our shadows of course again similar to lightroom but i would say this is something to pay attention to when uh your trialing capture one is just see how or, or see for yourself, do they behave differently? Can I push my image a little bit further than I'm used to? And I would say they don't quite behave uh, as Lightroom does. So on this particular shot, if I did want to see into the shadows, we could open up the shadows quite nicely, but to keep some depth and contrast in the darkest places, I would pull the blacks down. And what the blacks doing is really affecting the bottom 5% even of the darkest tone. So if I just drastically pull this black slider around, you can see what's happening. Obviously that would look super unattractive if we opened it right up, but it's quite different to what the shadow does, which affects a broader tonal range. So it's nice I can open the shadows and also make it not look fake and just pull down those darker tones a little bit as well. Yeah, as a general piece of advice I find for most folks is if you're going to pull uh, highlights or shadows one way, you often will end up taking the whites and blacks the opposite way, just to put a little bit of dynamic range contrast there at the ends. Yeah, and that exactly. just sort of prevents clipping and washing things out. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it just, I mean, just because we can do that doesn't mean we should. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that shadows have emotion. And if you destroy all emotion in your picture, then yeah, it's not a it's, great picture. It, it, with great power comes great responsibility. And, and there's always the, the danger of wanting to liberate everything that your camera saw, but at the end of the day, we can't see that. So if we were wandering down that street and as soon as it becomes unrealistic, I personally then find a picture uncomfortable to look at. Um, for example, we could dehaze the, the mount we'll try it in a second we can dehaze the mountains in the background we can bring all that detail back but it's highly likely that was misty at time of capture so it doesn't really make mm -hmm. sense um but this picture is actually a really nice candidate to show one of my favorite tools which is uh this one the magic brush uh because this is a typical kind of shot where you'd think okay it's a little bit bright in the background maybe the color balance is a little bit off or something. What about if I threw a gradient mask? So I could draw down a gradient mask. If I press M on my keyboard, we can see what's going on. Whoops, helps if you draw it in the right spot. Uh, and then I could pull down my 
you know, highlights or you could bring the exposure down, but it's always going to affect these areas as well, unfortunately. Just because the, the gradient, you know, on a, an actual uh, gradient filter on a camera is a perfect gradient, quite often the scene itself doesn't really lend itself to that. So we have this really cool little tool called a magic brush. So this is really, if I just zoom in a touch. So this is really uh, a brush that will draw a mask for you. So layers are a little bit different uh, in Lightroom. It's probably closer, I'd say we're closer to Photoshop than Lightroom is in the fact that we can work on several different layers. Each layer can have a different opacity. Each layer we can create that mask in a number of different ways. You saw me do one with a gradient mask just now. We could draw by hand, we could create radials. We can build a mask based on luminosity, which is very powerful. Um, but the quickest way to do it is with this guy, which is a magic brush. So if I right click and look at our tolerance for a second, our tolerance is deciding when I draw on the picture in the background, how wide of a net, if you like, we're catching pixels. So how broad of a net are we going to catch pixels of similar color? Now to see this happen, let's just display my mask. So I'm just going to do a little squiggle here and see what happens. So, and so that's defining what pixels for it to look at. And it did a nice yeah, job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now but, we've but viewing in. that mask with the M key is important, folks, because the, the red indicates where it's being selected. David, yeah. can you change that color? Like that red is a little similar to the, yeah, the we wood can. if I want to make sure that it's not getting any of the wood. Uh, where are we? It's under appearance, I think. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, mask color at the bottom. There we go at the bottom. Yeah. Thank you. And that yeah. brings up this guy. So if we want so like, to... there's no, gr there's very little green in this. So yeah. So sometimes folks changing your mask color is great because it will help yeah. you see if you're getting any of the wood there. So like I could see that's bleeding into a little bit of the roof there on the far right, David. So oh, yeah, you just either feather there. that or, or clean that up. Yeah. Well, what we can do actually is if I, let's just um, clear that mask for a second. So if I um, drop my tolerance down a little bit, and let's just make sure my mask is visible. So if I just draw up in here a bit, so that looks a little bit better, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a little bit, but to be honest, I'm not gonna worry about that too much because uh, if we bring our magic mask back and we change this to refine the edge, so that's gonna just mm -hmm. feather the edge a little bit better on the next brush stroke. So I can right click and clear that. So if I just do that, then we can nice. fill in a gap here, fill in this gap. Now that's pretty much good. And to even get past this tricky mask color, what we can do is look at a grayscale mask like so. So mm -hmm. now that will show us the mask is the white stuff. So if I wanted to fill in that bit, I could. And now yep. that bleeds into here a bit more. So I'm going to undo that, Command yep. Z. And if we wanted to, we could bring the tolerance down super low and then just try and attack those spots but and a little, me, and a little bit a, a little bit of the mask affecting the rooftops is not unrealistic folks because those rooftops no, exactly. are reflective so therefore it would be reflecting the sky so it's not unheard of for it to affect that a little no and to be honest if it's like a perfectly cut hard edge it, it looks fake to look, <laughs> looks fake anyway um, I think there's probably, if I turn the mask on, so we've got little missing bits here. So if I grab the magic brush and yep. make that super small, then we can just fill in nice. those little bits too. And depending yeah. how picky you want to be, we could even go you know, down here as well. Yeah, and there's um, always the undo key for a reason. Exactly. So we could fill in all those little bits and pieces if we yeah. wanted to um so if i zoom back out again and now because we've got this layer by itself if i just do a dramatic adjustment you can see what's going on but i would probably pull those highlights down a bit and i'm only going to be doing subtle changes i wouldn't pull around mm -hmm. the uh the exposure no. a huge amount uh, one thing that's to... unique to your tool that others don't have is i see there's multiple modes for clarity can you explain what yeah, i'm looking sure. at there because that's actually, and, and color balance is great here. So you're warming or cooling that area yeah. to shift it. 
So if we wanted to just take a little bit of that, because it's very blue, I'd just go the opposite, just yeah. over here a bit. But I still wouldn't go completely neutral because... And that, that's something that people correction. struggle with. Like they do strange yeah. color correction, but with the color balance tool, folks, all you're doing is going the opposite way. And actually, David, what I would end up doing here, and maybe just humor me, try doing the shadows and, and, and midtones a little bit differently, like lean into the blue for yeah. the, the, the actual mountain part. You know, like you put a little more blue into the mountains by pulling towards it. And then, you know, you go away from it with the other one. That creates, again, color contrast so that yeah. the difference between the the snow on the mountains and the mountains themselves stands out. So sometimes, just like you'll nice. pull shadows and highlights in opposite directions, taking your color wheels in opposite directions on, on shadows and highlights creates additional color contrast to go with the tonal contrast. Yeah, nice tip. And then we can... Contrast is beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not it's not just cranking up the clarity or the detail slider. So No, exactly. Um, and the fact that, you know, if we wanted to do some kind of drastic exposure shift or, or whatever, then this isn't the kind of mask I'd do because I'd want it to look more yeah. natural. But for playing around with the little color tweet, and we can name this, always name your layers, uh, then that works, you know, absolutely perfectly as well. Nice. And what I also like about the, the magic brush is that it's not it's not restricted to a sky or a subject, you can magic brush anything. So if I just make another layer and you wouldn't want to do this, but if I wanted to just fill in um, this spot as an example, uh, then I could do so. Yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, in that case, it's a pretty bright area. So being able to knock it down a little bit in exposure yeah. could make it not be so distracting. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. There is oh. a magic eraser coming, should anyone ask. <laughs> so we can't have one on without that. the other, right? Yep. <laughs> so David, I'm going to give you, is, take two more minutes to edit this image. And then I want to show off your, your panoramic feature, but for yeah, a vertical yeah. panorama that a lot of people don't think about shooting, because it works great for that too. And that'll be something like a lot of people, go, oh, I don't need to shoot panorama. I've got a 40 megapixel picture. But one yeah. thing you can't do is shoot a really tall scene sometimes. Uh, it's easy to go wide, but it's hard to go tall. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the other nice thing about panorama, of, co of course, is just if you're in that situation and you don't have the lens to squeeze everything in, then you can do a quick handheld panorama and yeah, yep. you're good to go. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to edit in this picture before I show that? No, well, this, you know, it's, a, it's an easy photo to edit. I mean, with a few little tweaks like this and then a little color shift in the sky, I would probably... Mm -hmm. I might make it slightly dark. I'm looking at a bright light, so I yeah. might not be editing to the best of my um, ability. And if we look at our before and after, then- Nice. The after. sky really comes back beautifully, but still has that natural look. Yeah, exactly. So as I said, we don't have to liberate every single piece of dynamic range. I mean, this is a GFX 100, which is a, a great camera, but of course, yeah, keeping it natural is very important. Excellent. Well, I'm going to do a quick panoramic example. While I'm doing that, William had put a question into the chat pod, not the Q&A area, that you okay. might want to take a look at. Maybe you'll have a tip for him on that. I'll just do a, a simple panoramic example. Let me share okay. my screen. There we go. Cool. And so, uh, David, when did you guys unveil your panoramic tools? How long have those been in there? So that was at the launch of Capture on 22, which was December the eighth or tenth something like that so if you've been um, busy this year it's it yeah. wouldn't be unheard of to have missed them perhaps missed that yeah <laughs> so three months ago this this okay. came out and it's had a revision since then with a few you know tweaks and, and improvements cool well i'm going to do an example here that was shot from a drone and a lot of people don't oh, cool. realize that you could actually do a vertical panorama on a drone where it'll do the base shot and then it will tilt the camera up to get more of the sky and tilt the camera down to get a little bit more of the floor. And yeah. so it kind of really opens up some interesting ideas. Now you guys fully support the DNG. So you just select the range of image and, and then you just tell it to stitch to panorama. And it's gonna bring up some different methods. Now, this is an example where because we're covering a big curved area, we wanna think of it being more spherical as opposed to cylindrical, which is typically a single row 
going around, you know, like a 360 or a 180. So spherical will give us a little more natural. Now, this shape is normal because we did tilt up. So we got more of the sky and more of the floor, but this gives us quite a bit to work with. But Panini was also interesting here. We were talking about this ahead of time as an artistic choice because the center of the photo is so far away. I kind of like that. I think it actually yeah. did a nicer job with a little less distortion in the middle photo, pulling that out a little bit more, a little bit more linear there in the center. So very cool. So so can you automate the drone to 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 angle up and down at the right amount, or was that yeah? You just hit a button. Possible? You just hit a button, and a lot of them will do it now. So nice. it's it's called a vertical panorama. It's in a lot of the software. This was just shot on a a base level, tiny DJI drone that was a Very below thousand nice. dollar device. So uh, I was out at the um, Valley of Fire in Las Vegas and mm -hmm. one of my favorite places to shoot. And, and then what that does is it stitches a new DNG file, which has all of the raw data still. So we can then go to that file and start to edit. So I'm of the type that I don't ever mind seeing what auto will try to do. Uh, but then I like to dig into those settings. Like you were pointing out, I really like going first and taking a look at the actual curves. Mm -hmm. So in this case, looking at some of the contrast there really is kind of nice, the film standard, but the linear response did such a great job of bringing mm -hmm. back that sky and clouds there because the desert's pretty high intensity on brightness. Mm -hmm. So that really helped kind of even it out a bit. Um, once we have that, then for me, I'm looking at things like the white balance. And so what I'm looking at a scene that has a lot of color is what's happening up here in the histogram. And so I see that there's a kind of a diversion, like green and blue have a lot of overlap, but the red is kind of spiking to the side. And so what a lot of folks don't know is that as you move those, you can see that change there and look at how basically Kelvin is pushing the reds and blues apart. And so you can see that shift and you know you don't wanna to go too far, but a little warmth there. And now my reds and blues are a little bit more overlapped and I'm happy with that. And then looking at tint, that's gonna shift the relationship of the green to the other channels. And so I could just gently shift those until I feel like I've got a little bit more of a natural overlap in the scene. And that's of course subjective. Uh, you can come down of course and look at your color balance here. So as we look at the different areas, we can adjust them independently, but I like where that's going. Now, another thing that I like is to make a strong black and white. So I like to mix these. And so I'll tend to look at the sky and push the blues one direction and then look at the cyan, which is also in the sky and play with that with a little bit of a different value to create the conversion. Then I'll do the same for the reds in the foreground, and that's gonna have a little bit of gold as well. And so again, by taking those to different amounts, you create contrast between the two sets of tones, which works pretty nicely. I like where that's going. I feel that's pretty good. And then I'll come on into the rest of this. And now I'm just looking at where the gaps are. So I see a little sort of fall off here in the shadows. And so I'm gonna play with my overall shadow slider and just fill in that space a little bit so that it doesn't lose those details. There we go. And then looking at the highlights, you can see how it's moving the top part of that histogram along there. So I like that. And I'm gonna use your tip of the brightness slider. And that kind of slides the whole elephant down like you can just see the whole middle of the histogram sort of shift so by moving it there we can now push the ends out more with contrast mm -hmm. and we start to get a nice little value let's take a little bit more down on the highlights there we go and i like that we're really bringing the scene to life now for me david i like the full screen view so mm -hmm. that as i'm editing the sliders kind of disappear yeah and yeah. that way you just focus on the image, but that's just my preference. And obviously this is subjective. Um, mm -hmm. Some of these other cool tools you have up here, talk to us about this one here, the ability to keystone. What are we looking at? 
So Keystone will, um, well, actually, it's interesting you mention that because this is this is something that's that's going to get better in the forthcoming update. So right now you have to manually adjust your lines. Um, mm -hmm. So typically, if we think of the falling down building syndrome, if if you like, so when you point mm -hmm. the camera up, your building verticals converge, um, but you can tell Capture One where the error is and exactly that. It's mm -hmm. then going to force the image to 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 correct. Um, it works very well, um, but of course, time-wise, as Rich is having to do, you've got to place your your different points um, and describe the error to capture one. But what's coming in the next update is basically a nice auto option as well, where we will look for vanishing point and lines in the image and a few other things I probably don't understand on a engineering level and then correct the photo. Um, and I would say on 90% of cases, the auto nails it as well. But the good thing is it's not doing anything weird in the background. So the current Keystone tool um, yeah. will actually dial in the values for you. So in Rich's Keystone tool, it would say, vertical has shifted this much and horizontal has shifted this much. And that's the same for the auto. So in the new auto, it's still going to move the sliders around to, to the correct amount, but you'll still have the ability to adjust that as, as well. And nice. we've added a, a fourth um, correction called skew, which mm -hmm. currently you can sometimes end up with like almost a trapezoid effect. Like if we're trying to correct something that needs to be super square, like a doorway, I guess is the best example, or an architectural um, element, sometimes it can end up a bit trapezoid. Uh, so now there's a, a new slider that's coming called skew, which, which fixes that too. Nice. And what I fun. wanted to point out here, David, before I showed you guys layers, to pull the viewer's eye into the foreground, I put mm -hmm. a gradient across the bottom and that just allowed me to darken the foreground so that you spent less time looking at the front of the photo and more time looking at the entire picture there. So you can see how it sort of just converts it going in. And I, I really like that because we can really get into the image itself and pull you into the scene and kind of get you past the foreground. So by using those transform tools, uh, I was able to just further manipulate the perspective to create this really long scene here uh, across the valley going into the mountains. So just something to play with. And a lot of times people think of panoramas of only doing one thing, but yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, computational <laughs> photography where I could take multiple shots and open up entirely different scenes than you could ever see through one lens. I'll yeah, pass yeah. back to you, David, unless you got anything else you want to point out about uh, some of the changes that are coming on this photo. Just, just wanted to mention you know, that's that's a great point actually. When uh, when we first first or when I first started thinking thinking about panoramic or panorama, you naturally gravitate to oh that's uh, you know me taking fifteen yeah. shots of a super wide building or or something like that, and I need to buy a really expensive um, camera. Uh, or not camera, I need to buy a really expensive panoramic head with a mm. super expensive tripod. Forget yes. all that. As if you ever get into the conversation of nodal point, it's not very exact anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nodal point is called software fixes that these days. <laughs> yes. I mean, quality in, you, you get quality out and, and everything. Um, but even on, hang on, I'll share my screen in a second. I'm just hunting yeah. for a, a picture. That sure. is actually quite a nice panorama. Right, let's bring up my screen. Uh, desktop two, that should be it. So, so in a very cold uh, Alaska, um, I think this is the right combination of pictures, but if we just stitch these together for a second. Um, another nice thing actually, so there's the, the stitch. If you stitching, a lot of pictures or you have a lot of megapixels in your camera, sometimes it can get a bit unwieldy, the stitch size. So you don't necessarily want to have, you know, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If this was a, a Sony A1 or something like that, or a GFX 100, that gets big very quickly. 
Uh, so a nice thing on the panoramic stitch is say, actually just give me 75% of that and let's stitch that together. Oh, here's one we stitched earlier. So you can see it stitching in the background, but that's uh, the same shot. It'll pop up there like so. Uh, but this isn't necessarily this super wide shot, but it just gives us different ways to, you know, express your photographs and everything. And this is quite a tricky one to stitch together because we've got all these container ships, snow and ice in the foreground, yeah, you know, lots of challenges there to stitch. So as I said, when I thought of panoramic, oh, it's about making big landscapes or whatever, but there's loads of applications for it. Like Rich uh, said with the drone photography, great option there. You don't necessarily need a tripod, just try doing it handheld. Get yourself roughly 30% overlap is, is normally enough. You can tell if you're, you weren't particularly level because your panorama will start doing this, creeping up or creeping down. But the algorithm's smart enough to deal with um, you not being perfect between every single shot. So if you want to invest in fancy brackets and, and panoramic heads, do so. But it's not a prerequisite if you just want to play around and have some fun. So. Great. Well, David, we've got time for uh, about five more minutes of quick tips for you. And then I want to quickly okay. show off the, uh, the aftershoot product, which works great with Capture One. Oh, yeah. Perfect picture. Let's a portrait picture would be great. Let's see some of the portrait editing. Yeah. So one thing which always comes up uh, for Edison, let's just reset this. Make sure this is as it as it comes out of camera. Um, it's another Fuji shot. I'm not intentionally just showing Fuji shots today. That's how it's. Last one was a Sony. Uh, that just seems to be of how it's been. Nice shot out of camera and everything. I'll probably mm -hmm. just brighten that up a little bit. Um, but as do many of us won't zoom in quite extreme amount slight color shift on the nose yep. as you can yep. see um and, and you may not even see that in the eye but the camera sensor is a little bit more sensitive to uh radiation definitely. and so the heat sometimes generates that color shift yeah exactly and babies' noses as well for some reason often shifting that's just because they're snot factories yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a bit of color shift going on here, uh, a little bit under the eyes and so on. Now there's two ways that we can uh, tackle this. Um, and there's the super powerful way and there's actually a quick fix, which works quite nicely, which brings us to a new feature. So first, slightly more powerful way in our color editor, where are you cover editor? Over here, I'm gonna bring this out so it's a bit easier to see. So the color editor, gives you obviously simple control of picking a you know, color patch and making some adjustments like so, as you can see. Uh, the advanced tool gives us more flexibility in the color range that I want to edit. So I can choose my saturation range and color range. Um, brilliant tool as well. But what we wanna look at on this one is the skin tone tool. So what the skin tone tool does is aim to normalize a range of colors into one common color. So if I was wanting to get rid of Neb's uh, slight shift on his nose here, I would say, okay, my target skin tone color is this, just on mm -hmm. his cheek here. And that's the dot indicated on our um, color wheel. And I want to make sure that everything in this triangle yep. gets transferred to target. that color. Say again? Right. Moves towards the target, very nice. Yeah, move to the target. So anything in this triangle, please move that towards the target. And the way we do that is with a uniformity slider. So if I drag hue to the right, the further I get to the right, the more everything gets pulled towards that target. And you can see now it's probably overcorrected, uh, but his nose is now longer, is mm -hmm. no longer you know, off in that terms. And so you can, can put that on a layer as well with its own mask, right? Exactly. So if we just reset this, we could, there's a couple of ways we could do it. We could grab our brush and right click to get our adjustments up. Let's just make that a bit bigger. And then we could mask the areas that I want. Oh, I've got my lovely yeah. fluorescent mask. You might spend a bit more time <laughs> doing it than I would, but you get the idea. Yeah. Um, hide that mask. And then now we can do the same thing, pick the target color, expand the net to catch all the errors. And we could be even more aggressive because the mask is 
only highlighting that spot. And then as I drag the hue to the right, we fix it, but things like the lips, which are not in our uh, fluorescent mask are not affected. So, so that's an even better way to, to do it. Very nice. Um, and, and combining masks with, with dedicated tools really makes it easier to get the results you want. Yeah, because a lot of the time you can spend ages fussing around trying to, you know, make the the perfect color range. And oh, I, I just need to cut out these bits, but I mm -hmm. want that bit, and I need a bit more of that. If you just drew a mask in the first place, even a rough one, and then selected the color within that mask, that's often the the fastest way to do it. Awesome. Um, but but an even quicker way to do that, which will take me thirty seconds is something with a style brush, which is basically, you can get rid of the color editor. Uh, let's get rid of you. Uh, style brush, which is an accelerated way to set up a brush, add a layer, add some adjustments to that layer in one click. So we have a style brush called, uh, where are you? Not saturation, red skin reduction. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I click that, my brush tool is selected. And as soon as I go onto the picture, let's make this a bit bigger and start brushing, a new layer is made called red skin reduction. And then I can brush where I want to go and job done. Nice. So, and then of course it's still editable. So you can touch it up afterwards to adjust its yeah. strength or lower the opacity of that layer if you wanted to be a little bit more subtle. Exactly. Yeah, dial it in perfectly. Yeah, but but style brushes are a great way for someone who's not super confident of working in layers yet, doesn't quite know how to set up the adjustments, but we've got lots of presets here, which, okay, I want to darken something, or I want to lighten his eyes a little bit. So I'll say um, dodge, and then I can just brighten up those two spots. Oh, I've overcooked it. So then I'll just bring yep. the opacity down, easy. It's always good to just fade it back if needed. Well, awesome. Yes, always. <laughs> well, I'm going to show uh, a quick thing here about uh, cool. saving some time. So nice. let me just open up Aftershoot. So the way Aftershoot works is it's an add-on that works with Capture One, and it allows you to process your shoot in advance. So you simply say, I want a new album, target the folder before you've imported, although you can actually do folders afterwards and write new metadata that gets updated, but effectively it's designed so you could just add a folder. And so you tack that in, I'll do this one here and I'll just say import this folder. And then you get some simple tools. So it loads it in for a very easy culling and you could manually cull if you wanted, but what it's really designed to is allow you to process. And so you could say, how much am I open to blurred photos? So shallow depth of field and motion blur, or I really want this tack sharp. It has the ability to group duplicates. So it looks across the 30 second shoot range and combines them. But if you're doing something like still life, where there's really not a time constraint, then you can go extreme and combine even more. It also will choose the best amount of images. So the top 10% per set, the top 20%. So that means if you had 10 photos, it would pick the best two. And then there's another algorithm called sneak previews that was actually trained by looking at half a million photos and how they did on Instagram. And it identifies those that are gonna perform best for social media. You then have the ability to say, look for closed eyes, look for blur, look for duplicates. And you can then decide how it labels it. So what are your selects and sneak previews going to be? Does it change the star and the color label? Or if you've already used those in Capture One, maybe you just want to add keywords. And so you have the ability to just add keywords to your images if you've already imported them. So you're not overriding any stars or labels. When you click go, it starts the culling process. And it's very fast. And you'll see that it basically starts running. You can uh, adjust the speed there, but it will take a few seconds to process all the images and it will then try to sort those down. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of process shoots already and show you how I can use this, but you can see it's pretty quick. And so what they've managed to do here is start to narrow it. And so it's finding the ones that are blurred. It's finding the ones that are best. And you'll see that as it starts to detect similar images, it will stack those together and identify the best one in that stack. So it's able to actually find images that are very similar and narrow it down. So here it was able to say, hey, in this image, let's take a look. 
it thought that this was the best one of the three. Now you can override, and that one's definitely soft. I like this one too. That's pretty good, a little bright. I think I actually like this one. So I can add that to the selection if I want. Press the right arrow and go. And as I step through, it's identifying the best in each stack. And then those are the ones that are gonna get targeted. Now, when you're done, it'll do a handoff. I wanna show you though a portrait session because this is where it really shines. It started as a tool for portrait and events. And so what it's able to do is really process those down. So here was my daughter's recent Eagle Scout ceremony and it picked this one of the best of the five. But you could step through and see, and it does find eyes closed, for example. I could see his eyes are closed. You could zoom right to any individual face if you wanna quickly check those and see how you were doing. And then just move to your next image as you go through, and it's gonna be able to narrow that down. Once you're ready for the handoff, it's a very easy click. You just choose export. And at this point, you could go to a folder or do it manually, but it has a one-click handoff to Capture One. So with that one click, it will just pass it off to Capture One, take the photos that you've selected, and actually move them into Capture One with the labels and stars and metadata in place, just speeding things up. And what I find is that I am able to take something that was a giant shoot and get it pared down. So you see 48 from 152, 34 from 145, being able to find the ones that were best with our eagles here. And you could quickly filter as you're working and narrow it down. So I could say, hey, just show me the ones without duplicate images. That's great. And let me see the ones that were selected. And so now we were able to narrow down that very large shoot and find the best ones for both sharpness, composition, and other properties. Now, that doesn't mean that every shot is gonna be good. One of the things to keep in mind is it picks the best of each bundle. So you are gonna to wanna to be mindful that if you have all bad shots in a burst, it still might pick a bad shot. But what it does is it picks the best of each burst, allowing you to really narrow it down, particularly if you like to shoot burst. All right, well, that brings us towards the end. David, thank you for joining us on our first Capture One Hangout. I can't think of a better guest since you uh, have known this product. <laughs> if you guys want to check out Aftershoot, they're the sponsors of this. You can actually just go to Aftershoot and uh, they do offer a, a free version and it won't reject any image. It always picks the best one from any similar image. And uh, it is both available as a free tool and a paid tool. So the free tool can automatically detect the closed eyed and blur eyed and it can automatically find uh, faces. So that works really well and it hands off seamlessly to Capture One. If you want to apply the auto ranking, then you'll want to take a look at the uh, $10 a month plan. And again, that fully hands off. So David, thanks again. Uh, we are glad to have you. We do have a bunch of stories up on PhotoFocus about Capture One. So be sure to head on over to photofocus.com and you can explore those. Thanks to our partners at Aftershoot for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, David, I encourage people to look you up. You've got tons of tutorials and videos on the Capture One site, correct? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so you can also go to learn.captureone.com where there's blog posts, tutorials, webinars, short tooltips. Don't forget those tooltip access in the application itself. Um, yeah, but there's tons of material to, to keep you going as well. Excellent. Well, folks, and of course, check out the Capture One uh, YouTube channel. Lots of great videos there. And as David said, you could just head on over to Capture One and the learn.capture one to keep learning more about the product. David, thanks again for joining us today. We're really glad to have you on the show. And folks, thanks for turning out. I hope you guys had fun and learned something. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>